What's going on, man? Welcome back to the basement. I'm Ron, and I just got done with my early August redraft rankings update. And I got to be honest, we had some pretty big swings where I had players jumping up multiple rounds, coming back multiple rounds. And I wanted to be clear, I think earlier in the season like this, we're only in early August at this point, late July. I think it's wrong to dig your heels in on player takes. At this point, we should be pretty open-minded to new training camp reports, looking into old data, all of that stuff. Now, in the rankings themselves on patreon.com slash Ron Stewart, I even included in the positional rankings how much each player gained or lost from last update to this update. So you can see for yourself not only the risers, but the fallers. And all of that is on patreon.com slash ron stewart it'll have my redraft rankings they're all in tiers the positional rankings how much they've changed from last time to this time you also get my weekly waiver wire advice and fab guidance you're going to get my rest of season rankings all of that good stuff even all of that plus my dynasty stuff there's there's probably too much going on on the patreon patreon.com slash ron stewart but for this video today we're going to get into four players that are skyrocketing up my redraft rankings let's go <laughs> The first player skyrocketing up my rankings is Alvin Kamara, who was my 408 in my last update as my RB16 and is now my 308 as my RB13. Here's the thing. We're at week one of training camp. Kamara's practicing. There's still no word on his suspension. At this point, I think it's trending towards him playing and just not getting a suspension at all. And I had him in a spot right at that 408 spot where I was just trying to put him in a spot on the rankings where I would never draft him. He was my do not draft range. The biggest issue with him is that he has footage of the crime he committed. He was out there like curb stomping some guy with, I guess, a couple of his buddies, a couple of guys. And what ended up happening was is he got hurt. He like fractured his orbital something. And when that happens, that's a big no-no because there's an actual injury that happened. And on top of that, there's footage. And when there's footage, that's dangerous. You have the, uh, I think it was the Kareem Hunt footage, the Ray Rice footage. It's all really, really bad. So if footage came out on Alvin Kamara, he probably wouldn't be playing or he'd have a really big suspension. The thing is that we've gotten to this point, right? At this point, we are early August. He's been practicing. We've heard nothing about a suspension. We also have, I think, a pretty big part of this as well is we have Deshaun Watson at the forefront of all the news. What's his suspension going to be? All that. And Kamara's kind of slid under the radar. And if I'm going to be honest with you guys, I think at this point we can pretty much say footage won't be coming out. And I think it's probably a 50-50 shot at this point that he serves a suspension at all. And if he serves a suspension, it'll probably be in 2023. So at that point, when you're getting Kamara, who is a known commodity, right? He is the most recent running back to have a legendary win rate season. 20% plus win rate in 2020 had the six touchdown game on Christmas league winning running back upside. He also has been nothing but super consistent. He's also only finished outside of the top five running backs in points per game once during his five year career at this point. Again, we know who he is in terms of ceiling. He's up there with Eckler, Jonathan Taylor, and you're getting access to all of that upside at a third round price tag. The suspension it's baked in at this point, you're essentially weighing the percentage that he gets suspended versus the percentage chance that you win your league if he plays. And I think at that point, we're kind of getting to a conversion spot in that late third because we have in that area, I mean, you have ETN, you have Brees Hall, all of those guys, but none of them have quite the upside of an Alvin Kamara if he doesn't serve a suspension. Now, I will say this could definitely go south, right? It could come out literally tomorrow that he's suspended for four, five, six games. He could be suspended for the entire season, but we're in training camp. This is trending in the right direction. And if he doesn't get suspended soon, his ADP is going to skyrocket. So I want to get my shares in now. Again, I haven't been drafting him all offseason. I think right now is the perfect time. I would go underdog, whatever, use promo code Ron, hop on there. I'm literally doing drafts all this weekend, or this is going to be out on Monday. So all last weekend, just trying to get some Alvin Kamara exposure in. Because again, each day that happens where we look around and it's like, is Kamara just going to play all 17 games? His ADP is going to skyrocket to that one-two turn area. So I want to get my exposure in now. And again, we're going to get news soon. So even if we get burned and it comes out that he's going to be suspended four to six games and his price moves like the 50th pick overall, we're going to have this short period of time where his price is a third rounder. You can get the exposure in now. 
at this price and then you can smash those leagues with a third round Kamara and if he gets suspended and his price bounces back to like pick 50 or so you got burned but it's only the small blip in time where this has been the cheapest he's been all offseason and we're getting news soon so there's a small window here where you can capitalize on the value if you're okay with that risk now i also want to say if he gets suspended like four games that's not the biggest of deals when we're talking about a third round running back in the dead zone because again he has upside like no other running back in the area he even has a higher floor than any running back in that area and when we're talking about running backs most of these guys miss on average three to four games. So if Kamara is going to miss four games off the bat, you get them out early, he plays the rest of them. It's probably not a massive difference versus having a normal running back when you're getting Kamara at a third round price. Next up, we have Chris Godwin, who I had as my 605 as my wide receiver 36. I moved him all the way to the 411 as my wide receiver 23. So like a round and a quarter to a round and a half in like 13 wide receiver places. And the difference is, is that he didn't start training camp on the pup, which is massive. If you start training camp on the pup, that means you're probably trending towards not playing week one. And it's not a good thing, especially coming off of his ACL tear. Now, this would this would imply him not being on the pup that he's going to be practicing very soon and would have him trending towards playing in week one. And now this isn't just me talking out of my ass, fellas. I went to Twitter. I saw one of the uh, injury analysts. This is four for four's injury analyst, Adam Hutchinson. And this is what he had to say on Chris Godwin. I'm telling you guys, there's a really positive outlook on Chris Godwin right now he said I completely changed my tune on Chris Godwin to a certain degree his current ADP wide receiver 26 is a great value in my opinion but it's sure to rise and I'll cool on him then he co-signed a wide receiver 25 projection on four for four so this is a guy in Chris Godwin who would be a mid to late third rounder without injury and if he plays week one we're gonna get a down tick in efficiency or maybe he misses a couple games that's all baked in there. We're getting that pick like 62 right now, which is insane. So I want to be getting in on him right now. Again, I'd have him in my top 24. Seems like he'll be playing week one. I think he's a massive steal right now, as long as we're getting this discount and all of this uncertainty is baked in. Now, again, you guys see this exposure number of 2%. I haven't drafted a ton of him so far, but his recent news is so positive that now I want to dip my toe back in. I actually just recently drafted a team, a redraft managed team uh, over on the FFWC I got him at wide receiver 38 in the sixth round. You can get some crazy values on Godwin right now. And if he plays week one, he's ahead of that ACL schedule. It pays off before he even steps on the field. Then we have Chase Claypool, who was my 808 as my wide receiver 44. And now he's my 706 as my wide receiver 44. So I didn't really move him up my wide receiver rankings, right? He stays at that wide receiver 44 area. But I moved him up a tier. I moved him from that Sky Moore, Olave, Christian Kirk tier for me. And I put him at the back end of Kadarius Toney, Tyler Lockett, DeAndre Hopkins, Hunter Renfro type area. And the reason is, is that reports have been coming out about Claypool playing slot wide receiver in camp. Brian Batco, he's some like Steelers beat reporter. He said the first team offense at the time that he was watching was Pickens on the outside, Deontay Johnson on the outside, Chase Claypool in the slot. And I did some digging and I'm really excited about Chase Claypool's new potential role in the slot with Juju gone. Now, you might be saying, Juju was hurt last year. He hasn't been, even been good the last few years. And Chase Claypool still sucked last year. Here's the thing. Claypool played 20% of his snaps last year in the slot. And the reason why that wasn't higher is because not only Juju was there, but James Washington and Ray Ray McLeod was there. Ray Wave McLeod, James Washington had 144 slot snaps and 324 slot snaps. Both of them are now on new teams. So we have of 810 slot snaps last year from 2021, we have 638 of them now available. And while vacated targets aren't good, there's still going to be vacated slot snaps that are out there, right? We know that snaps and routes are given, targets are earned. That's why we don't like vacated targets, but vacated slot snaps are still fine. The Steelers aren't going to all of a sudden run less three wide receiver sets and just run out of 12 personnel because Juju's gone. I think they think that their wide receiver core is probably better with Juju gone. Pickens has been looking great in camp and Claypool fits perfectly for that slot role. I think he's drawing live to get that slot role. Last year, he had 105 slot snaps. Deontay Johnson only had 45. And when we look at Pickens and Deontay Johnson, they both primarily play on the outside, almost strictly on the outside. If we look at Deontay Johnson last year, he ranked first among all wide receivers in reception perception in outside percentage with 93.8% of his sampled routes coming on the outside. Now, 
on the other side of that, when we looked at all prospects on reception perception from 2022, George Pickens was first among all of those wide receivers in outside percent with 92.9%. Both of these guys clearing 90% of their routes from the perimeter. Now, when we look at Claypool, he fits for the slot. Again, he had double the amount of slot snaps as Deontay Johnson last year. He was thought of coming into the NFL. People kind of forget this, but he was thought of, he might have been a tight end coming in. People wanted him, you know, maybe we'll, we'll use him as a, a move tight end and he can be this big uh, red zone type threat. And he even played that role in college a little bit. At Notre Dame, he hit a high of 42.5% of his snaps coming out of the slot as a sophomore. So he's familiar with this role. And the whole reason why I'm excited for this role change is because with a spike in slot snaps, we're going to have low A dot targets for him. And that's going to play to his yak and big playability because on the perimeter claypool operates as this deep threat wide receiver with a high a dot and the issue is, is that bad quarterback play is going to really drag you down in that role we saw last year ben couldn't get him the ball and this year i don't think you can bank on kenny pickett and mitch trubisky being efficient on deep passes and when we look at chase claypool we look at players with over a 10 a dot and 100 plus targets he was one of only four wide receivers with five or more yak per reception we're looking at jamar chase mike williams cd lamb cd lamb jamar chase two guys who are absolute playmakers with the ball in their hands chase claypool is up there now we know yak isn't sticky year to year but chase claypool also cleared five plus yak in year one we now have two back-to-back -back years of him having a high a dot while also having a lot of efficiency after the catch he is at the very least a big play wide receiver and somebody that is electric with the ball in their hands so this will unlock a lot of his yak and a lot of his upside in the slot where he's now going to get the best of both worlds he's going to have high after the catch efficiency targets out of the slot in three or more wide receiver sets and when it's two wide receiver sets he's going to be on the perimeter with high a dot targets giving him efficiency before the catch and that's interesting because now he has if he's going to be on the perimeter he's going to be downfield and if he's going to be on the inside he's going to be able to use his yak so that is really interesting and it's also not just yak that he's going to be doing out of the slot he's actually a really good route runner on those slot snaps if we look at his highest win rates from last year even on a bad season he still ran great success rates on those lower a dot routes like the out route the curl the comeback the flat the slant the screen he had green in all but one of those routes and again this is a talented wide receiver that we know can earn targets if we looked at the rookie leaders and targets per out run from that 2020 class he was first among all of those wide receivers in targets per out run with a 23.57% targets per out run ahead of Jefferson, ahead of Judy, ahead of Higgins, ahead of Lamb. And that was on a Steelers team with Ben Roethlisberger and a 13.3 average depth of target. So he's earning targets down the field from a guy in Ben Roethlisberger who didn't even want to throw it that far. So this is a super high upside wide receiver, athletic freak. He's going to get high dot targets. He's going to get low dot targets where he can show off his yak. I'm very much interested in Chase Claypool. I even fired off a irresponsible tweet the other day and i said it wouldn't shock me at all if this year's year three breakout a la debo last year marquise brown deontay johnson last year godwin calvin ridley the few years before that it wouldn't shock me at all if that was chase claypool this year i love his cost in that eighth round area the last guy we're going to talk about today is ramondre stevenson he was my 909 as my rb 37 now he's my 806 as my rb 33 and I moved him from that Ronald Jones area to Edmonds, Singletary, Clyde, Miles Sanders area. And I think at this point, his upside is too good to pass up. This is a guy we know has juice. He was 11th in yards after contact per attempt last year, six in elusive rating, third in yak per reception. Mike Clay has New England projected for a really nice environment for the running backs in that offense. He has the New England projected for the fourth most rushing touchdowns and 13th most rushing attempts and the reason why that's so important is because there's a lot of scoring to go around he has Damian Harris and Ramondre Stevenson both in the top 36 running backs in fantasy points they're both RB3s in this projection I would almost call New England like San Fran light where you're going to get a lot of like Patriots way Bill Belichick schemed running plays that are efficient and work well and again they run the ball a ton so there's a lot of scoring to go around at the running back position and RB 35 you know he's behind Damian Harris and that's not a great median projection but again for a split backfield I think that is a great median projection that you know we're drafting him at around RB 35 and even if he doesn't take work from Damian Harris and he just exists in this offense as the 1B he still is an RB 3 and is fine but the reason I love Ramondre Stevenson is because he has 
all the upside in the world. He has a three down skill set. He can catch passes. He's projected for 38 targets in this offense. And the interesting part is with James White. James White is projected for 57 targets, but he's currently on the pup. He hasn't practiced yet, and he's a cut candidate at this point. Brandon Bolden, as well, last year had a lot of targets out of the backfield. He's now gone. If James White gets cut, we're looking at Ramondre Stevenson inheriting a massive amount of targets. Where he goes from like 38 targets, like 50 plus, and then from there, that's really interesting. Now, I'm not going to assume that Pierre Strong or Kevin Harris are going to take on any of that role. A lot of the times, these Patriots running backs redshirt their first year, like what we saw with Damian Harris in his rookie year. And this is where Ramondre gets interesting because there's a massive pie in New England. And if he inherits that massive chunk from James White in the passing game, we're looking at a guy who could flirt with top 24 numbers. But the reason why I love Ramondre Stevenson is because that's not his only out right now. There's reports coming out that Ramondre Stevenson is running with the ones in training camp. And what if Ramondre Stevenson not only gets the receiving role, plus like 40% of the carries, that's where he's at right now. But instead, he's the 1A. Damian Harris is the 1B. He's getting the receiving work with James White gone. And then if he's the 1A, he's instead getting like 55 to 55% of the rushes. And at that point, that's top 15, top 24 numbers. And then on top of all of that, on top of the upside that he has without even needing an injury, if he got all of that going for him, and then Damian Harris was to go down, which we know running backs get hurt, Ramondre Stevenson's instantly like a top 12, top 15 guy at that point. And that's interesting. Again, this room this team generates a lot of fantasy points for the running backs we've seen it with like blunt we've seen it for stretches with like deon lewis it's a spot that i want access to as well i think that this offense is going to score more points than people give them credit for where i think mac jones is going to come into year two make this offense a little bit more i wouldn't say modern but a little bit more high efficiency high scoring i don't know i think ramondre stevenson's one of these pieces in this offense that unlocks a lot of upside and that's going to do it for us today again if you want access to the new rankings update and see which guys were the fallers from this new update that is going to be on patreon patreon.com slash ron stewart i'll have my top 150 redraft rankings my tiers my positional rankings my risers my fallers waiver wire guidance you got my uh rest of season rankings all of that good stuff a community in the discord patron leagues all of that good stuff is on there check out patreon.com slash ron stewart for all that good stuff if you enjoyed the video, make sure you down below, subscribe, leave a like, and I will see you guys in the next one. I got the juice, I got the juice. Channel, chat on zone. Foolies, glad I'm on. Even my haters kind of glad I'm on. Rest in peace to my bag of on. Rapper, song, singer, suspended subpoena from Mr. Me.